The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it only takes 12 days for Jesus to go from newborn to two years old, which normally we'd say that's a pretty strange time jump. But given the year we just had, time seems a little funny and a little weird altogether. Those who watched the stars, who studied the sky, who began to understand that the stars were a way to predict seasons and changes and the movement of the earth through the cosmos, were often looking for signs and symbols that something amazing had happened. Indeed, these wise ones who come from the east had been watching the sky for a very long time until one particular configuration in the sky let them know that in fact something amazing had happened. We know that this story takes place sometime around Jesus' second birthday because the story that follows it, one that's celebrated in the midst of the Christmas season, tells of how Herod chased after all of the children two years and younger in the town of Bethlehem. So we have some sense that when the wise men revealed exactly when the star had appeared and how long they had been waiting, that the child had been around for a while. And so it's a little funny that as we come to the close of the Christmas season and we have this one final celebration of Epiphany, we just go ahead and pile the wise men into the creche along with everybody else. And pretty soon we have shepherds and a barn and angels and wise men and everything all in one scene. It's not very accurate if we think about the story that the gospel tells. But it does get our sense that on some level, everything and everyone in heaven and on earth was drawn to this child. You've probably seen this in a smaller effect in your own lives. Have you ever gone to a family celebration and there's a new baby? They are like a magnet. Everyone immediately runs to stand next to the child, to hold the baby, to talk to the baby, make faces, see if they can get, make faces back. Hopefully not be that one relative that when you hold the baby, all the baby does is cry, right? The good news is, if it's not yours, you can hand it back. But now, Jesus is two. And I wonder, had Jesus already learned the two-year-old's three favorite words? 
No. I imagine it was pretty challenging for Jesus' parents to look at this little boy and to hear those words come from his mouth. We have to wear clothes if we're going to go outside. No. We have to eat our supper. No. We're going to go somewhere now. No. That must have been rather frustrating. But what about, what about when this little one who had drawn the world to himself looked up with great earnestness and said, why? Why? I almost wonder if Jesus might have responded to these wise travelers in this way. After all, up until this point, the people who had primarily taken note of Jesus were simple folk. People who were in awe of what they had witnessed and what had been revealed to them. But now, people from far away, people with gifts to bring, people who had been waiting a very long time, came to Jesus in his house. And when they poured out those treasure chests, I wonder if Jesus wondered why. Because if you've ever been with a two-year-old, you know that's probably their second favorite word. And then I suppose it was particularly challenging for Jesus' caregivers when he discovered that third favorite word, mine. Because he's the only two-year-old in all of history for whom that was actually true. He could run over and grab a tree, mine. That's accurate. Pick up a bird, mine. Also true. Pick up a rock off the ground or touch a friend or a neighbor. Mine. Also true. As a matter of fact, friends, today, if what you need is just to hear this one word, there's a two-year-old Jesus running towards you at full tilt, just waiting to grab hold of you and say, Mine. And it's true. And it's true. His love for you goes through all time and through his entire life. But the story of the visit from the Magi is about more than just a child. It's also about the life that Jesus was going to live. On the one hand, he would be recognized from time to time as one who had come in power and might, one who had been recognized by God to do great things and who would be honored and blessed by those around him, whether as a child in the giving of these gifts or as an adult when he would be anointed for his burial. In any rate, there would be those who would honor Jesus. But of course, there would also be those like Herod, those who wanted to know every detail, every little spit of the story, not so that they could know Jesus or so that they could embrace him or that they could worship him, but rather so that they could find him and stop him before things got out of hand. Because after all, what could be easier than to simply dispatch with a child? Might not even notice that he had gone missing. No, we hear in this story that Jesus lived a life at risk from the beginning. And so that while there were those who would pay him homage, those who would celebrate and worship his arrival, there would also always be those who longed to stop him, to silence him, even if all he said was, why? Or in great love, mine. Friends, as we wind our way through the end of this Christmas season, as we begin to take apart what we spent so much time putting together, even just this morning we spoke about, it's time to drag the bins up from the basement. <laughs> those bins that we dragged up weeks and weeks ago, and begin piece by piece 
to take apart at least the signs and symbols of Christmas in our house. And that's also true here in the church and in many homes. Let us be attentive to this moment because I don't want to shock anybody, but the next time jump we get is going to be a lot longer than infant to two years old. We're going to go from a two-year-old to a 30-year-old, which is great because we get to skip the annoying teenage years, right? But also, the next time we meet Jesus, he will be grown and he will be ready for God's mission. Let's cherish this precise moment to have this encounter with the little one who has drawn the world to himself, that all creatures in heaven and earth have sung for his birth, and now even those who will not ultimately be part of his sect come to give him honor. I think about how in this time of Christmas when we had two holiday Fridays, one after another, where normally the comfort zone would be closed and there'd be no breakfast, that there was actually breakfast on Christmas Day and breakfast on New Year's Day, precisely because we have these wonderful friends from a Zen community in Middlebury, Vermont. People can come to honor, even if it's not their tradition. And we can partner together with those from many traditions around the world to do the good work that God longs to see done. And so I give thanks for that because I see wise ones coming from afar to honor the neighbor with something as simple as a hot breakfast and a lunch that they can take. So let's savor this moment. Let's savor these final days of Christmas. Tuesday the 5th is the 12th day of Christmas and Wednesday is the celebration of Epiphany. Let's not tear it all down too quickly. Let's not let it go too quickly. Because in this precious moment, we have the opportunity to have an encounter with a God who is still very small, who is honored by those who meet him, who lives in a world that's just as dangerous as it is today and yet who reaches out to us, little hands, ready to embrace, looking in our eyes and reminding us, mine, we belong to this little one, now and always. This is the gift that God has given that no one can take away. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.